Um, I want to thank you for having me. And this talk is called Small Rituals, Big Ideas. But there's a story first, and I was asked to write a proposal to do one of the big performances here at the conference. And I sent my uh, little proposal to um, Steve Coles, and then he had his committee meetings, and then he emails me back, and he says, Hi, Justine. Um, you know, we looked at your proposal, and we just think it's just too small, and can you redo the whole proposal and make it big and spectacular, and, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, uh-oh, it's not really what I do. And I really work quite small. I work pretty much on my own. And um, so then Mary Neubauer emailed me a few months later saying, can you give a talk? You know, and then, so that's what happened. So here I am, and I want to show you my first proposal. Oh, this isn't the first one. You're going to gonna have to just deal with all this stuff. So, no, so let's go back. Little low tech. Oh, this is the first one. You can find out. It's a video. Okay, this is my very first performance art piece. Okay. And then um, I found, I was cleaning out my cupboards and stuff as one does, and I found this little poem that I wrote when I was about 12. And it goes, I run, I dance, I act and paint. New shoes, new tights, new lines and paper. A mile to go, for leaps to do, and then I'm almost through. Curtain time, I sign my name. Okay, I may have been 10. But um, anyway, I, obviously I am so grateful for something called multidisciplinary art that it exists. Because for me, performing arts ticks all the boxes. And I, now we can go to this one. Um, I want to talk on the magic and power of small-scale, multidisciplinary, multicultural works of performance art. This is a journey that asks, what is there to think about? And ultimately, just two things, ourselves and the universe. These small works are pathways to universal truths. By nature, small-scale rituals are often more truthful, honest, and complete than the larger endeavors. Through performed by individuals, these rituals can nevertheless incorporate many skills, disciplines, and diverse locations, and can be experimental and expressive of collective consciousness and large themes. Performance art has the potential for complex layering and its ability to depart from conventions that long define the value of modernist art. There is no single conventional form an artist can work with. Uh, artists can work with theater, dance, painting, sculpture, film, word, fashion, design, for example, and sound, obviously. And performance artists relish constantly changing approaches and challenges to conventions. The artists I chose today all work across many disciplines, and I believe are an inspiration for anyone working in the arts today. So we're going to start with Anna Benietta, if I say her name right, and anyway, who was born in Cuba in Havana in November 18, 1948, and she passed away in 1985, in September. In 1961, along with her sister, she um, moved from Cuba to the United States because she was on the anti-communist activities in Cuba. And so she pretty much lived in foster homes. And um, after the foster homes, she did an art degree in Sioux City, Iowa, and she has an MA in painting and an MFA in intermedia arts. That's what they used to call it back in those days. Um, it may seem like an obvious choice, but I feel Anna Manita's work needs to be re-examined and feel her contribution to art is important. The nature of um, her work is spiritual and ephemeral, and much of her art expresses the pain and rupture of cultural displacement and exile. She fought to cast off established classifications, land art, body art, performance art, and her work is rooted in cosmology of pre-Christian religions and the Catholic symbols and rituals of Mexico. Her aim was to create works that were infused with magic and power, a prehistoric and ancient art. These influences become visual in Manuenta's work, and the use of blood and feathers, which is what this example is, and her use of gunpowder and fire. We can go into the next one now. Yeah, yeah gunpowder. And her exploration of burial chambers and connections she forged with goddesses. She makes a deep connection between her own body and the earth. 
and in her words, I'm overwhelmed by the feeling of having been cast from the womb of nature. My art is the way I re-establish the bonds that unite me to the universe. It is a return to material source. And um, I think this one is called Soul Silhouette of Fire. It was done in November 1975. And then it fades out. And the next is from Mud Pictures. And these are her mud works. So I've got two examples. And they were done in 1984. And the mud represents for her, she would the idea of taking mud from the woman's place where the, a woman may have grown up and her ancestors and taking it to when she gets married and moving the earth into the new place of, of living. So she made these sculptures, and this is what this represents of, of the different types of mud. And she started to work more in a sculptural way at this stage. And unfortunately, she passed away not long after these pieces. Um, so I think there's one more. Huh? And that's another one of those. I love this shape. Okay, so next is, um, is that crystal? No, we're going to have to do it this way, guys. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's go that one. So I, I chose Chris Turing, and he was born in Colombia, Sri Lanka in 1948. He studied sculpture at Camberwell School of Art, and he began his career very much in traditional sculpture. But in the 70s, he moved into land art, and he's really well known, I'm sure you might know his work, really huge land art pieces in quite a few in America. But he started working the landscape with natural materials. And his body of work includes ephemeral assemblages of natural materials, installations inside as outside, and works on paper, works with maps, and digital and video art, with mush and works with mushrooms. So making connections between different phenomena in the world, between nature and culture, micronism, macronism. To this end, these are his words, to this end I collaborate with scientists and technicians from a broad spectrum of disciplines, and we use whatever visual means, technologies, and materials suit the situation. So this is medicine wheel. It's um, made of natural objects. So it, it was made during um, August 16, 1982 to the 15th of August, 1983. Yeah. So what he did is every day he took a walk in the same path and he found one object and to make, a, to make this sort of calendar. And um, it's all natural materials. So each object represents each day of the year. There's 12 segments on paper, one for each month, made, made during that month with the pulp of that particular plant. And uh, plants from mushroom print, I think, is the center. And I think, I think what I really like about it is it's so sensitive. And to me, it's a really beautiful piece. But I like the fact that it was just him walking, the ritual of walking and deciding what to pick, and uh, a natural a stone, a feather. And I think what he said is, as he kept going on, he found it more um, difficult making choices. Because I think the more you do that ritual walk, you see more over the year. And sometimes there were incidences, I think his father was ill, or there were incidents of loss in his life at certain times of the year. And so they have very, you know, very significant peace. Very good. And we have the mountain color. So this one is called Fire Mountain Corn. It was done in um, the Kochi Prefecture, Japan, 1996. In the seemingly empty Canadian tundra, the Inuit people built cairns resembling people to ward off aloneness. In Lapland, they do the same. In Europe, we mark trails and summits with stones. In other parts of the world, we use cairns have a religious significance and may contain a relic. They are also used for memorials to the dead. If a shelter is a stopping place, then a cairn is a comma, and the fire cairn is a longer pause. It's breathing in. And um, I just wanted to show this piece of his. And he did quite a few of these. And I'm sure you can, to, you can go on his website to look at more. And next, let's go down to, um, there's a video now we're going to do, which is this one here. 
And this is his latest, one of his latest videos. It's called Shattered Peace, Broken Peace, Broken, Shattered Peace, Broken Promises. And it's a 10 minute silent film. It's just a stick of sage bundle. And he used an explosion to, the sound of the explosion makes it move. And it's, it's actually, I think, really beautiful. So this this is um, can you guys see that one? I got another picture to show. This is Lewis and Francisca Weinberger. They're an Australian artist duo. Lewis and Francisca Weinberger. They work around nature and art, an open-ended <coughs> investigation rather than a production for display. So they're closely linked to the concept of labor. They plant gardens and develop landscapes and create archives for performing ritual acts, such as Home Voodoo One, which is the example here. And he makes a list of the materials. <coughs> the materials are snowman, ostrich fern root, peeled barberry root, charcoal, plastic flower pot, Christmas candle, Lord's water from his late mother's, bottled Mark Lord's 1983, place of act, stands troll, uh, 6th of January 2004. So the snowman which is a winter personified, was originally intended to ward off the threats inherited of that season. It is transformed into voodoo doll. They covered the snow. There is a superstition linked to the ostrich fern, a plant that grows primarily in the mountain terrain. It is called witch herb, or which is ladder, because no seeds or buds can be found on it, only on midsummer's night, which when the fern blooms can it be collected. They are said to bring good luck and make you invisible to the devil. A plastic flower pot serves as a hat and a holder for a Christmas candle. They documented the ritual act in a series of photographs, which shows Lois at first lighting the candle and then setting the peeled, we can go, well, it shows a peeled candle, and the blueberry is the arm, the medicinal plant, which can cause mild, non-lethal poisoning. The snowman is progressively doused with holy water, the water Lois's mother brought back from the pilgrims. In performing this act, Lewis and Francisca combines a number of historical and private myths which can be traced through customs and rituals. The characteristic and effects of plants are often the point of departure for stories on the conjuring of spirits, the banishing of the devil, or the unbound exploration of the soul. The interweaving of social and religious worlds reflect patterns of behavior. By layering the distinct cultures, the artists succeed in creating a narrative and performing an action determined by a dialect process of difference <coughs> and commonality. So, now back in 1995, I bought a book called <coughs> The Chapman of Art by Susan Gablick. So I don't know if any of you read that book or not. Um, but anyway, it really inspired me to work in the environment. And it's just when I started working in three-dimensional work. And I encountered the artist Dominique, and it's a French last name, but I can't say it, Mazoud, if anyone knows it, and Fern Schaefer. So I'll start with Dominique's work, Dominique's work which is that one, there, and that's it. Okay, <coughs> Dominique began her art project she calls the Great Cleansing of the Rio Grande River. And she's a French artist who moved to America about 25 years ago. And she lives in New Mexico, Santa Fe. So once a month, virtually on the same day, each month, armed with a garbage bag donated by the city, she and a few friends who sometimes accompany her meet to clean pollution out of the river. Part of her work involves keeping a diary which is the following extract, and that's all the documentation. This is the only image. I think there's probably three images going around. It's this one, and the other two aren't really as good as this one. And she is not interested in making objects or anything or anything like that, but she's interested in text and writing and her diary keeping. So I'm going to just read a few extracts from her diary. Okay. So 
November 19, 1987. My friend Margaret drops me off at Diego promptly at 9 a.m. Because of the snow, I was not sure of the conditions I would find, but did not doubt a second that I would put on my day. I find a stone warmed by the morning sun, which makes a perfect site for my beginning prayer. Yes, I see what I am doing as a way of praying. Picking up a can from the river, and then another, on and on. It's like a devotee doing countless rosaries. November 24. Visitors stop by my door and look at a group of objects laid down on a strip of fabric. What is this? they ask. These are some of my treasures, I say, I've collected from the river. You found this little girl's shoes? Yes, I reply. Even two five dollar bills? I'm glad I am walking slowly because it allows me to catch great pictures. It's not that I can carve them out and put them on a frame when I get home, but it is that they are such strong images that they quickly feel the screen of my mind. They are called soul imprints in my river vocabulary. December 2nd. Why in all religions is water such a sacred symbol? How much longer is it going to take us to see the trouble of our waters? How many more dead fish floating in the Rhine River? How many kinds of toxic waste dumpings? What are we going to turn our malaise of separateness around? Most of the glass we find is broken, but even so, the two of us pick up 103 pounds in 14 hours of work we put in that day. How many times did I wonder about the person who hurled beer bottles down the rocks in the upper part of the river? or later on from on under the bridges, trying to imagine what went into that action. Is this the man inherently violent? Is it that there is nothing else to do but smashing bottles into the river? Is it pure and simple fun? March 19th. I can't get away from you, river. In the middle of the night, I feel you, feel you on my back, in my throat, and in my heart. One more. July 20th. The two more huge bags I could hardly carry to the cans. I don't count anymore. I don't announce my art for the earth in the papers either. I don't report my findings nor my time to the newsletter of Santa Fe Beautiful. All alone in the river, I pray and pick up, pick up and pray. Who can I really talk to about what I see? I feel the pain quietly, knowing that I too must have been unconscious at one time. I have also noticed that I stopped collecting the so-called treasures of the river. It was okay in the beginning, but today I feel it was buying into the present system of art that is so much object oriented. Is it because I'm saying that what I am doing is art and that I need to produce something? November 10th. I call my river journal my riveries. It is too sweet a word for the feeling of that, my rivery musings, but often bring up in me. Would rageries describe them better? But do I really rage? I've been talking a lot about feelings of pain and sadness. Is rage my next step? Would rage affect the way of my work? Would it make me more of an activist than I am? Would it make me more open to community? And what is it that I am doing in this river? What Dominic's projects force us to think about is the power. She isn't complete, competing in a patriarchal system at all, but stands true to her own feminine nature. Yeah, I know. It's, sorry, guys, we're almost done. Um, <laughs> she makes the ritual process into a redemptive act of healing. It's a dialogue with the river. She is a living being as something to say. I have landed in a new landscape when I have discovered the river as a true artist as I am. She says the greatest gift, however, is what the river has taught her, to be silent and to listen. And then along the same lines is quickly um, Fern Schaefer and Othello Anderson's work. I don't know if you've come across them or not, but also from about the same time period. They did um, these rituals called Nine Year Rituals. They spent nine years um, doing these rituals and nature, and they signify with a particular ambience of earlier world, view, world, world views and ancient cosmology, a lost sense of oneness with nature and acute awareness of the ecosystem. So that's one of those. And then, what was the name of the book? Uh, Reenchantment of Art, Susie Gatlin. Yeah. Um, 
And this is how she does the installation. So she actually will take her costumes and install them in the galleries. And so she actually documents a lot more than Dominique's work does. So I quite like that. But the costumes are just kind of flopped on the wall. <coughs> so um, next, and we're going to go now because this is my introduction to doing like environmental art or performance art. This was my very first, my very first perform. Well, this one. My very first sort of environmental performance <coughs> art I did. And I did this um, 1995. I was 35 years old. I started, you know, 35 years old. And I had my son with me. And what I did was I wrote down, it's, the title's called Having Seen Half This Floating World. And I wrote down everything that happened to me in my life that I could remember. I mean, everything from day one, you know. So I wrote it all down in these little strips of silk organza. And I just moved to Wales, which was in my little cottage there, and it's this beautiful countryside with a river, and from Hong Kong to Wales, I mean, you know, um, I just fell in love with this magical landscape. So this was my way of doing something there, and it was my first case that I did, I just started studying sculptures, this is what, how it worked. And I tied all these little bow, they look like those little things on, every Thing on and filled up the whole vines from that were falling from this tree and I left it for a year and obviously my son had to help me because he was only two years old and um, <laughs> so that's um, then after a year I took it down now I go to the next one and I turned it into just this little ball and then I had my photograph myself just holding it so that was my, me in my life at 35 years old. So that was my first piece and, um, in the environment. And next we have Aura Berry, which is a video. And I hope that's a video, that one. Okay. It's called, Aura Berry is an Irish artist. I've come across her work about year 2000. And she's lived in Brussels and she's now back in Ireland. And she works with language and the both spoken and written. And she doesn't limit herself to one technique. She's really good at drawing, photography, and sound and performance. And this is a piece called Bastard Town's Blogger, and 2002. It's located in sunny South East <coughs> Ireland, County Wexford, in a small town or village. In a, um, although it actually exists, it's also a fiction notion. The video paradox starts with its title. We see a so-called blogger describing the day in his life. I don't need the book of predictions. Everybody's predicting what's going to happen anyway. More concrete, more pedestrian shopping streets, more CCTV, more green areas, more car parks, more blacked out four wheel drives, more digital TV, more broadband, more communication via voice over internet protocol. Joe Gordon Mobile, insurance for everything. Mixed markets, credit systems, outsourcing, insourcing, trend scouting, new family types, my liberal guilt hits me. Hot dogs, fried chicken, french fries, fried shrimp, frankfurters, hamburgers, hot corn, Italian sausage, seafood, shish kebab, cold beer, warm beer, soft drinks, hard alcohol. Soy milk, popcorn, cotton candy, ice cream, hot pizza, extra strong coffee, latte, iced tea, added to the free carrot cake, cold clams, cold beer, flame guns, crisps, Italian ices, seafood, frankfurters, all beef hamburgers, french fries, fish fingers, ketchup, sushi, coleslaw, pot noodles, smoked chicken, smoked macaroni, smoked duck, charcoal broil, shish kebab. Mobiles, I'm queuing for a ticket, queuing for check-in, queuing for passport control, queuing for hand luggage, queuing for security, I'm queuing for boarding, queuing for a place to sit, queuing to go to the loo, queuing to get off the plane, queuing for passport control again, Queuing for luggage, queuing for customs. I am queuing for a sandwich, queuing for a bus ticket, queuing to get on the bus, queuing to get off the bus. I am queuing to get where I am. <coughs> I am 
surrounded by people carrying plastic bags and drinking from plastic cups. Babies haul around synthetic toys larger than they are, and our parents try to lend a helping hand there are hysterical screams of independence as the insulted infant roars, I can do it myself, Penny. So it actually is um, a lot longer than that, and if you wanted to, I think it's on Vine now, on the what it's called, so if you wanted to Google that, you can do that. Um, the next work I have is Sabrina, and I cannot pronounce her name at all. She lives in Brooklyn, I love her work dearly, and it's, here we go. Gosh, what? No, I have no idea. Does any? I don't know. Can you say? Do you know? Gosh, Wanter. Gosh, Wanter. If anybody's interested, I have the spelling. You know. So um, now her work is called Crocheted Film, and what she did is 2004 to 2010. She's shown this work. It's a testament to time and the handmade. It's an 80 feet of film. Should we go to? It's um, this one here. Yeah. So I'll just. you to know that this is how I'm working now, as opposed to my own. So um, we have one more. Right. And then because you saw my first, first, very first piece, I haven't changed. I'm still sticking thread in my mouth. And you missed out on that one. So first, you want to see it real quick? Show me. There we go, this one. This is my very, very first, um, that was my first art piece. <laughs> So anyway, performance art remains an extraordinary, complex, and expressive idea that transcends language, form, imagery, and monetary value. Performance defies categorization. It's transient, live, dangerous, and experienced. It can be a smell, a sound, a video, a photograph, a story, an object, an idea, a relationship, a moment, but it exists and it persists. And it is asking us what it means to be here now. And thank you very much. And for all